There waits for me a glad tomorrow Where gates of pearl swing open wide And when I've passed the veil of sorrow I'll dwell upon the other side Someday beyond the reach of mortal ken Someday God only knows just where and when The wheels of mortal life shall all stand still And I shall go to dwell on Zion's hill Someday I'll hear the angels singing Beyond the shadows of the tomb of heaven ringing while saints are singing home sweet home someday beyond the reach of mortal ken someday God only knows just where and when the wheels of mortal life shall all stand still and I shall go to dwell on Zion's hill some days my labor will be ended and all my wanderings will be o'er and all is broken, ties be mended, and I shall sigh and weep no more. Someday beyond the reach of mortal ken, someday God only knows just where and when the wheels of mortal life shall all stand still, and I shall go to dwell on Zion's hill. Someday the dark clouds will be rifted, and all the night of will be past, and all life's burdens will be lifted. The day of rest shall dawn at last. Someday beyond the reach of mortal ken, someday God only knows just where and when the wheels of mortal life shall all stand still, and I shall go to dwell on Zion's hill. Amen. Matthew chapter 17. We'll go there. Matthew chapter 17. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 17. Continuing on in our study. Follow me. Follow me. We're getting to the end of Christ's ministry here and his opportunity to teach his disciples. I've learned a lot about what it takes to follow Christ. And when you follow Christ, he promises he will make you fishers of men. In other words, he will make you fit for the ministry, suitable for the master's use. As a, as a potter takes a lump of clay, so God takes you and makes you into something beautiful, something useful, something, something tangible. Can't do much with a lump of clay, but in the hands of a of a, a master's hands, he can he can spin that thing and, and and move his hands in such a way that it creates a a suitable vessel to do something with. And so God wants us to follow Him and allow Him to mold us and make us fishers of men. We saw Christ charge us through the pages of Matthew to follow Him to the common people. To follow him into doctrine with application. Those are the foundational things. Follow him to faithfulness. Being faithful with your time and your efforts and, and, and just your belief and trust in him. Follow him to glorify God. Let that be your focus. Just bringing God the glory for everything you do. Follow him forward. We talked about in that message about persevering and pressing on even when everything is pressing against you and fighting against you. Get forward. Look ahead. Charge forward and charge on. Christ says, follow me to reach the world. And he talks about how his ministry wasn't just closed off to a certain group, but he wanted it to be one that spread abroad throughout all nations. Follow me bearing precious seed, that precious seed being the word of God. And, and that is what actually gives any ministry any kind of merit or value is just how much it is based upon and how much it propagates the word of God. That's what brings fruitfulness. Without the seed, you don't have a plant afterwards, correct? increasing, follow me increasing, in other words, always pressing on the upward way, getting better each and every day, and, 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 and not just allowing yourself to become stagnant in this Christian life. Follow me undefiled, in other words, not being defiled by what's coming out and within. Remember we talked about in that message about how it's not that which goeth into the body that defiles a man, but that which cometh 
from without and into the body. In other words, eat what you want, your body's going to sort it out, but what comes from the mouths of false prophets, that will defile you. And that's what we talked about. We, we said there's different influences that come into our lives that we need to cut off because they're defiling our walk. Follow me furnish. In other words, accepting all the provision that God has given us and using that to, to be the foundations of our ministries. He provides and we just simply obey and walk forward in what he's given us. Follow me as revealed. Remember how we talked about how, how Christ has a special revelation of himself to each one of us individually. He wants us to know him personally. He wants us to have that relationship that Moses had, a face-to-face opportunity to meet with God, talk to God in a special way that only God would ever share with you individually. And he has that for you. He knows his people so much that he's counted the very hairs of your head. Of course he wants to sit down with you and talk with you and lead you and love you in a special and unique way. Follow me through suffering, and it's through suffering that we truly experience fellowship with Christ. And these are all different lessons that we've learned along the way, and now we finally got to follow me, and as the Lord leads, I'll make a title to this. But I believe what he's going to tell us about here is reaping a little bit of the divine nature, okay? So we've learned about suffering and how we can fellowship with Christ in that suffering. We can also then fellowship, I believe, with Christ in a little bit of the divine nature. Not that you yourself are divine or anything special, but you can have his nature upon you. Now look with me to Matthew 16, just back a few pages, and in verse 24. Let me read for a bit. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. It's almost like a little bit of a reset here. We've had follow me and I'll make you fishers of man up until now. And now Christ says, take up your cross and follow me. It's almost like here's a different aspect of the ministry of following Christ. He's been teaching them how to be an example, how to draw men unto Christ, how to, how to show that, that Christian spirit outwardly and, and draw men unto the Savior. Fish for them, as it were, and catch men. And now he's saying, now follow me on to the cross. Follow me on to suffering. Follow me on to sacrifice. And before he does so, though, he wants to show what is available to those that do. And so he says specifically to his disciples, the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And so any kind of glorification always has a source, and that's from the Father. Christ was glorified of the Father. He, he said, I have glorified it and I will glorify it yet again. We'll read that again here when he does so. He wants then, Christ wants then, us to walk in that same glory of the Father. And how does that happen? Well, look at this passage here and it says, There be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The Father glorifies the Son, the Son comes and leads his kingdom is what we find here. This passage, often debated, but I think is partially fulfilled in several ways in the context of the scriptures, okay? So there are certain men standing there, being his 12 disciples and anyone in earshot, who shall not taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. They will not die the, the death of every man until they first see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. First partial fulfillment, I believe, was John receiving, John the Beloved receiving of the book of Revelation. And in that book, he saw Christ coming in his kingdom. He saw the final 
and to all things clearly laid out before him. He experienced them through the vision when he was caught up into heaven and saw the throne room and saw the armies and saw the beasts and saw these things. He had Christ revealed and seen clearly in his kingdom at that time. There's a one fulfillment. The next fulfillment is when I believe the church was established and received of the Spirit at that great day of Pentecost. And so Christ coming in his kingdom was as he promised, if I go not away, I can't send the Spirit unto you. And so when he did that, he actually established the church as the pillar and ground of the truth. He set up his kingdom among men in the church to, to be, and he was to be the head. He was to be the king over that body of believers. And so there's another one. He established the church. And in doing so, he fulfilled that where some of them did not taste of death until they saw the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Another opportunity, or another way is that 100 AD. If you remember, the Romans destroyed and sacked Jerusalem. And so that was actually the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. In other words, doing what was prophesied of him in a, in a partial way. Now, I believe in an end time, book of Revelation, return of Christ to wipe out the armies of the earth and establish his kingdom at that time. I believe that that's going to happen. But partially, as most prophecies do, it was revealed, I believe, also when Christ said, one stone shall not be laid upon another. And he prophesied that, Within the lifetime of these people, the Roman church or the Roman government, the Roman armies, as an extension of his arm of judgment, sacked that city and destroyed it like no other, so that not one stone was left upon another. That was fulfilled, and that wall that they all stand next to and wail beside is not anything to do with Christ and his kingdom, and not anything to do with Jerusalem that was. Because I believe in 100 AD that came to pass. One stone was not left upon another, but all were thrown down. So there are three different ways that someone might look at this being fulfilled in his people. Not tasting of death until the Son of Man comes in his kingdom. The next way, which is most direct, is literally the next verse. He says, there shall there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. In verse 1, it says, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And so Christ revealed himself changed transformed, transfigured before his disciples. In his glorified state there, for a moment they saw how Christ would appear when he came and when he would come in his kingdom. Now in verse 1, it talks of Peter and James and John being those special three that were brought into this high mountain apart to see this thing. Galatians 2 and verse 9, the Apostle Paul refers to James and Cephas and John as those that seemed to be pillars. So he recognized right away that, that these three men were of prominence, of preeminence among the church at that time, in the church of Galatia in particular. And he knew that there was something special about those three, and it might have had something to do with this close relationship that he had with Christ. Remember, Christ often had, had people that he dealt with differently, and now I talked about all of us have a unique experience with Christ. Jesus tended in his ministry to have, he had Peter and James and John who were close to him. He had the disciples that were especially close to him. The other, um, the other eight, or sorry, the other 11 of them, no, the other nine of them as it were, had them a little bit closer. And then he had the multitudes in the church at large that, that was also close to him in a different way. But these were brought together. They seemed to be pillars to see Christ come in his kingdom, have himself revealed in his kingdom. I believe that this is referred to, well, I know that this same event, you can find it in Mark chapter 9, you can find it in Luke chapter 9, but also in John chapter 1 and verse 14, it says, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And I believe that verse is actually alluding to this event here. We beheld his glory. We saw him glorified. We saw him as he would come in his kingdom, even if just for a moment. 
So another thing that will point to this transfiguration, and you can see what actually took place and what they saw, go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Keeping your fingers there in Matthew 17. In Revelation chapter 1, Verse 1, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. He sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and all of the things that he saw. So John here very clearly saw what was revealed here. And what he saw here in this book of Revelation was Christ coming in his kingdom. What did he see? Look at verse 12. It says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about paps, the paps with a golden girdle. So he saw the Son of Man with this garment all the way down to his foot. I believe the Bible gives, gives um, indication that that garment was white as snow. It says in verse 14, His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice was as the sound of many waters, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth, and his strength, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and I am the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. And so what these saw, and you can go back to Matthew, what these saw were was, a similar sight to what I believe happened in the transfiguration. John fell at his feet as dead when he beheld Christ in his glory, dressed in a garment down to the foot, head and hair white as, as wool, eyes as a flame of fire, talks about his feet as brass burning in an oven, white hot perhaps as it were, just this glowing and glorious sight so that he fell down as dead if it were not for Christ giving him another resurrection of sorts and bringing him on his feet. He might have stayed there. And I believe this is exactly what the disciples saw at the transfiguration when he changed. And verse 2 talks about that. He was transfigured before them Matthew 17, verse 2, And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And so you think of staring into the sun. You're not going to do that for very long. It just burns instantly. And this is what the sight and visage of Christ was. I don't know if you've done it recently, but we get so used to the winter months that when the sun is shining, especially with the glistening of the snow around you, it's blinding. You can't even barely go outside for the brightness of just a little bit of sunshine that we're, nor we're normally just fine with you, like out there. But you don't even it's not even just sunglasses that you need you need so much more than sunglasses it seems with that winter sun as it, as it burns down but here christ in his transfigured state shines as the sun with raiment as white as the light you could barely look upon him and even even as john fell at his feet as dead that great fear and that great bewilderment fell upon these three disciples seeing him in that revelation state seeing him in that coming to his kingdom state but not only seeing Jesus at this moment, they saw Moses and Elias. Look at verse 3. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. And so this is potentially, you could go out at a later date, what is in Revelation chapter 11, the two witnesses. And it talks about how there's two witnesses in the latter day. And a lot of people believe it's Moses and Elias because here they are with Christ. At, at his transfigured coming, at the picture of his coming, he gave to these three disciples. And so it would make sense then that at his final coming in the book of Revelation, they would be with him. Their ministry then was to go into the world and to preach. They did, min they did miracles similar. Or they will do miracles similar to what they did when they were on this earth, causing fire to come down and, 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 and that type of thing and, and stopping the rain 
those types of miracles are similar to what you'd find Moses and Elias doing. So there's all sorts of connections that say they were the ones in Revelation. And that would also connect then what I'm saying that the transfiguration is a is a picture or a precursor or uh, um, an image of when Christ would finally come in his kingdom. So a terrible sight, of course. They can barely see for the blindness. They recognize somehow Moses and Elias to be who they were, but they'd never seen them face to face. Maybe they heard the words that they were saying, or maybe the Spirit of God just impressed on them, and that's exactly who it was. Or maybe they have a name written on them. That's something we also see in heaven. I don't know how you would recognize these two, but they did nonetheless. And so the, for the fear and for the bewilderment of it all, Peter decides to open his mouth. And as he often does, we're not picking on Peter. He, he, he's, he's, he, he trips over his words, gets, gets himself uh, in trouble here. It says in verse 4, Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. Now, if you were, if you were to go to Mark and Chapter 9, in the same account, it says of Peter, For he wist not what to say, for they were sore afraid. So for the fear that was upon him, he's like, It's good that we're here, Lord. Let us make tents for you. <laughs> for he wist not what to say, for the great fear that was upon him. Luke in chapter 9, it says, Knowing not what he said. He didn't even know what he was saying when he was saying such a word. Like, uh, Lord, we're here. It's good that we're here. Let's make tents. And, and he, he didn't know what he was saying. He, he didn't know what to say, and, and it was because he had this great fear upon him. And no doubt, because look at the sight that they're seeing. It, it, it was so fearful that when John eventually sees it in the book of Revelation, he, he basically dies. It falls at his feet as if he were dead, cannot move, cannot breathe, cannot do a thing were it not for Christ lifting him up at that time. <clears throat> but while Peter, and you can turn with me, to 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1. Well, Peter did make this statement not even knowing what he was saying, and he did make this statement just not knowing what to say for the great fear that was upon him. In some ways, I believe this statement of Peter's, Lord, let us make the tabernacles, was profound and was actually a part of the lesson that being is being taught here. And, and this is this is interesting because Peter actually calls this event to remembrance when he begins his second epistle. Second Peter chapter 1, he begins talking about this very event. Of course, when he said, let us make tabernacles, he didn't know what to say. He didn't even know what he was saying. There was this great vision before him of Jesus coming in the kingdom. He saw Moses and Elias in their present state, and begins to offer to them a temporal hut, a house, a, a tent that they could live in as they traveled about. I think Peter was so impressed by how he saw Christ and how he saw the disciples and maybe connecting the dots of some prophecies of old, he thought this was the return of Christ in that moment. And so he offered them a place to stay for a while since they've arrived here in such a state. But I believe that Moses and Elias, they would have no desire to return to the temporal state. No desire to go back to dwelling in a tent. They had already been partakers of the divine nature. They were already glorified. Elias being caught up into heaven. I believe even with his body of flesh at that time. Moses dying up there on the mount, his body being buried by Jesus, but now tasting of what it's like to be glorified and in that divine or heavenly state. What reason then would these have to want to return to dwelling in a tent on earth? They'd already been there, they'd already done that, okay? So, 2 Peter chapter 1 I believe Peter's starting to grasp the practical application of what he saw there. Remember, Moses and Elias have already put off that old earthly tabernacle, as it were, and they are now partakers of something divine, something heavenly, something spiritual. 
Peter offers them temporal again, and they're like, I want nothing to do with it. Now think of your Christian life. You've been made partakers of a divine nature. The Spirit of God is dwelling in you. You went from living in an earthly, carnal, sensual, devilish way to having the Holy Spirit of God resting in you, dwelling in you, empowering you. You've been made partaker of a divine nature. What reason would you have, as Moses and Elias here, to take the offer of Peter? Go back to the carnal. Go back to the earthly. Go back to the sensual. Go back to the devilish. There's no good reason for that. This is why Christians need to always be spiritually minded and not carnally minded unless we find ourselves dwelling in the old tabernacle, the old tents that we used to. So, 2 Peter chapter 1, let's start in verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them, so he's addressing his letter, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, right? He once suffered the just for the unjust, right? That we might be made the righteousness of God through him and through our Savior Jesus Christ. That's how we obtained that precious faith. We believed on the substitutionary blood atonement of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is who Paul or Peter here is writing to, those that are saved, those that have, have received that precious faith, believed and have righteousness of God. Verse 2, he says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him, that has called us into glory and virtue. So, God's divine power has given us all things. There's nothing excluded from all things, correct? So here we have, and he'll get to it, in this word, all things that pertain or that apply unto life, everlasting and temporal, I believe, and godliness, everlasting and temporal. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us unto glory and virtue. So when you're saved, when you've obtained like precious faith and received the righteousness of Jesus, you are called to glory and to virtue. Okay? Whereby, verse 4, are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Okay? So we have great and precious promises that are given to us by his holy power and given to us along with his calling. You know what that's saying? He's enabling us to do what he's called us to. He says that here. That by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Lust is going to be what allures you and draws you away from the divine nature. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, which is a lust in and of itself. The lust and the desire to lift yourself up. So by these, what's that? The power that God has given us. By these, all things that pertain unto life and godliness, by these words revealed unto you, by these you may be partakers of the divine nature. How? When you apply these great and precious promises to your life. This is what Peter's, who he's writing to and why he's writing. He wants you to be a partaker of the divine nature. And when you are, you escape from the corruption that is in the world through lust. So what do we have here? We have basically you as a divine tabernacle, the world drawing you like Peter did to these, 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 these glorified saints, right? drawing them to a carnal tabernacle. We don't want any of that. They didn't want any of that. Peter didn't know what he was saying, and that's why, by and large, I think he was just kind of ignored in that statement that he made. But he's realized his error, and now he's going to explain what he was talking about. No, now he's going to explain what God revealed through him when he said those statements so long ago. Verse 5, beside this, giving all diligence... Add to your faith virtue. So, beside everything I've just highlighted, you can be partakers of divine nature. You're called to glory and virtue. God's power and God's promises is what enables you to escape the corruption through lust. He says, now here's the practical application of it all. Add to your faith, right? You've been given faith. You've obtained like precious faith. 
Now add to it. Don't just stay there. Do you know what that tells me? It tells me you can just stay there. It tells me it's possible for somebody to just give faith to God, receive the righteousness of God, and that's it. And they'll go to heaven, be glorified, they'll be saved from their sins forever. That's the promise that God makes. It's faith alone in Christ alone that somebody can have access to divinity, a divine nature, essentially, have access to heaven. But then he says this, Peter is practical. Add to your faith, virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. Now watch this. For if these things be in you and abound. So if faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, charity, kindness. If that's in you and abound. They make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, you will produce fruit. You will not be barren. You will not, you will not be, be lacking any kind of production and multiplication of yourself. You will be made a fisher of men. This is what he's saying. If these things are in you, that's exactly what you will be. You will be made fruitful. But, verse 9, he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sin. So, you Christian have been purged. You have been made clean. You have, you have access to all of these promises and yet you can choose to be unfruitful. But the promise here is this. If you're seeing afar off, and you remember the fact that you have been purged from your old sins, and you acknowledge that Christ gave you salvation through the faith that you offered him, you're able to be made partaker of the divine nature. You're able to be made to have all of these attributes in your Christian life. These attributes, faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity are all expressions of the change that God put in you. Of course, you can quench it by just not applying it. Nevertheless, if you apply it, you will not be barren. You will not be, you will not be unfruitful. You know what that's saying? If you don't have any of these things in you, you're blind and you've forgotten that you were once purged from your old sins. People do that all the time. <laughs> they just forget the salvation that took place and just get back into the lusts of this world, which he highlighted there, the corruption that is in the world through lust. That'll just sweep them up and take them away and they will never add to their faith. It happens all the time. But let it not be so named among you. Rather, believers, you ought to have these things in you and not only have them in you, have them abound in you. Mo like great multitudes of these different character traits. We need to be diligent to add to our faith these things so that we can maintain our course, especially in times like this. We can continue on in 2 Peter chapter 1, and in verse 10, it says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The calling and election, what was that? Back in verse 3, where it says you've been called to virtue and glory. In other words, you're called to give him faith, receive righteousness, and to move on to glory and to virtue. And that will produce in you a walk where you never fall. You never trip, you never stumble. And that's a great thing for believers. You have, to, you have to think about that and you have to want that because when you fall, your family falls. When you fall, your church falls. When you fall, everything around you tends to go down with you because there's a lot of people and a lot of things that are counting on your success in the Christian life. When you fall, do you know why you become unfruitful? Because a fallen Christian cannot reach the people that are around him. And so God wants you to be fruitful. And so he wants you to do what he has done given to you now, making your calling and election sure, and then he will actually reciprocate in the same by making you those things anyways, right? Because when we're in heaven, we're not going to need to fight to be virtuous. We're not going to need to strive to be, um, be full of knowledge and temperance. We're not going to need to work at our patience. We'll be perfect. We'll be glorified. 100% without sin. But here... 
Peter says, if ye do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly. In other words, God will eventually minister these same things into you abundantly, right? But that day is to come into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we're called then unto good works. We're called then unto love. We're called then unto all of these different virtues that we add to our faith now in order that we can be partakers of the divine nature. In other words, showing what you will become here on this earth now. Okay? So he puts this all into the context then, what he's explaining to you, in the recollection of the events that took place at the transfiguration. Okay, so this is Paul's mind in remembering what happened on that fateful day. He says then in verse 12, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. In other words, he is always going to be teaching his followers to add to their faith. He's always going to teach them to follow their calling and election, which is unto, unto glory and to virtue. He says, Though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. In other words, presently you are, you are living this truth. I'm still going to remind you of these things. Verse 13. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, interesting choice of words there, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. So as long as he's dwelling in this body, Peter's saying, he's going to keep reminding you of these things. Even though today you know them and you're established in them, I need to keep reminding you in the, of these things. Why? Because you can fall away from them. You need to be diligent to maintain these good works. Verse 14, it says, Knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So there's the connection to the power and the coming of Jesus Christ and the witness that he had of his glorious majesty. That was back at the transfiguration and that is what springboards his teaching on them to be partakers of the same divine, um, the, the same divine um, <clears throat> nature here. The same divine nature. So... He's teaching them that he's in this present tabernacle. He's going to put it off. He's teaching them that living a certain way, as Christ outlines in his scripture, adding to your faith, adding to your belief, virtuous things, and, and living a better Christian life than those that would just not add anything to it. He's saying that living a better Christian life allows you to be partaker of a divine nature that God is going to give you when you come to Jesus Christ anyways. So he's basically contrasting what he saw. Here's Jesus glorified. You can't even look at him for his brightness. Here's an example of two saints that walked that walk, lived in this tabernacle on this earth, finished their course, deceased, as he says there, and then are now up in a new tabernacle. Then he's down here on this earth saying, in his present tabernacle, saying, hey guys, can I make you a tabernacle? Not knowing what he said. Not knowing even why those words came out of his mouth. But it's all to the end that he would actually paint the picture that he's now explaining to us. That there is essentially Christ, glorified, perfect, one day will be there. There's, there's, there's the glory that can be revealed into us. And so what Moses and Elias, Elias had there, we can experience by living a life of glory and virtue here on this earth. And then there's old fleshly Peter that's just always trying to give us some tabernacle to dwell in to bring us down from living that life. He's offering us lust and, and, a, and an allurement to just get back into that old man, get back into that old carnal, lustly, fleshly desire and, and live like you always did. Therefore, not adding to your faith virtue. Therefore, not being partaker of the divine nature. Therefore, not fulfilling your calling to glory and to virtue. <clears throat> He, he continues then in his understanding of this, saying that I didn't make up, in verse 16, any cunningly devised fables. 
He's saying he revealed it to them exactly as he saw it. He was eyewitness of the majesty, and that's how he presented it to them. Verse 17, it says, For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Verse 18 says, And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So there's where you see that Christ is showing, Peter is realizing that that revelation was Christ showing glory and honor that was due unto him, that we can be partakers of it. The voice comes down and affirms everything that's going on there. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved son in another place. Hear ye him when that take place, the whole image is finished. And so Peter doesn't embellish this a lot. He doesn't, I mean, the details are, are few, but the details are literally few to that event. We got to get more out of it by digging into what's going on in the bigger picture. And what was going on in the big picture was him showing how Christ impacts a glorified saint, us, when we're saved, and live as if we're glorified, and live free of the bonds of this world, making the old man dead and being alive unto Christ. When we're following Galatians 2 and verse 20, crucified with Christ, old tabernacle, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ dwelleth in me. And then that old life, always shunning it, always pushing away. Christ can empower us to live that life, and this is what Peter wants us to do. And Peter in that moment was like, ah, oh, I think I was the one drawing them away from fulfilling their desire, or fulfilling God's desire for them in achieving glory and virtue. So that at the end of all this, he is going to show us that all those visions aside, we have something more sure. Look, the vision is short. It's two verses here. We have something more sure, thousands of verses. 1,189 verses. More sure, not only in their revelation to us, but more sure just in the plethora of evidences contained within it. Verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So Peter here is just showing us the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, the preservation of the Word of God, and that it is more precious to us than any kind of word of prophecy, any kind of word of knowledge, any kind of vision that we may experience or what our hearts tell us. Why? Because ultimately the day dawn is going to arise in our hearts and he's going to dwell, like it said of that one Old Testament prophecy, between our shoulders. Okay? So what's greater? The word is greater than vision. What's greater? The heavenly tabernacle than this my tabernacle, which will ultimately be put off. And so Peter is, I think, revealing that the divine nature that is to be experienced one day, finally when Christ brings us home, can be experienced today if we are faithful to add to the foundation of faith virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness, add charity to that, then we can be partakers of the divine nature if we're built upon the same foundation that God here is showing us. Jesus, his salvation through faith is the foundation upon which everything is built. And this is what he's trying to show us. And I, he's like, I saw this vision. You can go back to Matthew chapter 7. He's like, I experienced Jesus Christ coming in his kingdom long before it ever came to pass. He's like, but you have a more sure word of prophecy whereunto ye do well that ye take heed. And we do well to take heed to these things. And in so doing, we will add to our faith and we will grow as believers. Matthew chapter 17. Let me just read the account that we have in verse 5 from Matthew's perspective. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. 
When the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. I love that saying at the end of verse 8. When they were lifted up, they saw no man save Jesus only. And I believe that the end of every revelation, and the end of every vision, and the end of every word of knowledge, and the end of every experience that we have in the Christian life ought to bring us to where we see no man but Jesus only. When we do so, we're following in the paths of these close three disciples who were of the twelve, who were of the church, who were of the multitudes. And they were able to walk in and have an experience, but an experience that indeed was grounded by the word of God. So here's bottom line, what I'm trying to explain here. In verse 9, we begin to see three different examples. Verse 9, he says to tell the disciples no things. So go to verse 10. Tell nobody again, the vision to no man, until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. Verse 10, it says, And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things, But I say unto you that Elias is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. So in Peter's vision, again, we have Jesus glorified, can't even look upon him. We have two of his disciples of old, essentially glorified next unto him, they could at least recognize who they were for the visage that they had. He saw Moses and Elias. And now we have them asking about John the Baptist. What about him? He's supposed to come and restore all things. We have three different men that are of the example that he's, he's explaining. Moses, he was in the wilderness. He had no certain home. He, he marched about wherever God led him. Picked up the tents, put down the tents. Picked up the tents, put down the tents. And then he always followed in that way. When he got to the point where he could see the promised land and have hope perhaps that he could put a certain dwelling place down upon it, God said, you won't enter in. He died on the mount. We have Elias who was wandering about, was often cared for and helped out by widows or by ravens or by whatever God could use to provide help for him. He didn't have a certain home. He didn't have a place where he could rest. He was wandering in that wilderness as he abode in this tabernacle. John the Baptist, he was in the wilderness. His food was locusts and wild honey. He was a wild man, they said, and he had had camel skins for his, his clothing. The same thing, no certain dwelling place. If you would, go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, and I'll finish it out. In Hebrews chapter 11, we have the book of, chapter of faith. The hall of faith, they call it. And in verse 13, it said, These all died in faith. Who? The elders that obtained a good report. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah. It says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. And were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. You have the opportunity to be a partaker of the divine nature. You have Christ in you, the hope of glory that's to come. Your calling is to be virtuous, show faith, be glorified even in this life. And that all hinges on how you receive of the more sure word of prophecy. Didn't he say that? He said, all of these visions, all of these things that I saw are nothing compared to the word of prophecy that we have. And he said, you have promises, you just need to apply them to your life. When you apply them to your life, you take your faith and you add to it. 
These then, in verse 13, died having not received the promises, but seeing them afar off. In other words, they applied them to themselves. They believed them. They trusted them. They knew that the promise was theirs, though it was never fully realized. They were persuaded. They embraced them, and they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. In other words, these lived in this tabernacle as if they were dwelling in a tent in a tabernacle, traveling about, having no certain dwelling. I'm a stranger. I'm a pilgrim in this earth. They had a complete focus on the heavenly tabernacle, which is to come. Verse 14. For they that say such things, in other words, confess that you're a stranger and a pilgrim in this earth. In other words, put off the lusts of this world and seek after a divine nature. They declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, you know, even as Peter tried to do to these risen disciples, these risen saints of old, have them be mindful of the country that they came out, offer them a tent where they could stay in. Truly, if they had been mindful of the country, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is an heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. We need to live as Christians, as strangers and pilgrims in this life. We need to focus on the tabernacle, the city, the dwelling that is to come and put off what's offered to us down here. No desire to turn back to the old man. No desire to turn back to the old life, the old ways, the old world, but press forward. Look at these saints. When Jesus was there with them, they were talking together and Peter came up and offered them and allured them to and drawed them to and motivated them to to get into his tabernacle that he was going to make. They barely acknowledged him. Why? Because they'd already experienced what the fullness of divine nature is. And we've got a portion of that. Therefore, it's going to be a little harder for us to turn away from Peter's tabernacle when he comes and offers it. I'm sure Peter would have done a great job in the tabernacle. He would have worked really hard to make it nice and to furnish it and make it all the best. Give it all that the world has to offer as far as beauty and and comforts it has. But when you put the greatest tent in the world you know the big three rumors that have all the furnishings all the fix and everything you could want in a tent the most expensive luxurious beautiful tabernacle or tent what is it next to the heavenly city the heavenly mansion the heavenly home that christ has to offer and so peter here is witnessing something about himself there's something greater up here but i am offering risen saints a shabby tent to dwell in even if it's the best tent in the world they've got it better and you know what peter here in his mind has come to the conclusion of i was saved i've i've been i've received faith i've gotten faith i've put my faith in christ I've, i've got an opportunity to live a glorified life to add to my faith virtue knowledge temperance to live righteously and godly in this present evil world why in the world would I bring a tent to this party? Why in the world would I bring an offer of a tent when I have divine nature available to me? And this is what Peter kind of pictured in his mind, and this is what I see as the explanation of the transfiguration. Christ, risen, glorified, beautiful, can't even look upon him, and what he's done to the saints and glorifying them as as he brought them along with him to show his disciples that they need to not look at the temporal, but always be focused on what's to come. Follow Christ in this. Be changed. Be partakers of that divine nature and so fulfill the law of God.